Okay, so let's get started. If anyone is interested, I always also have some printouts, so you can just contact me after the lecture, just, just in case. Um, okay. So all recording issues should be resolved from here on outwards, which ho hopefully is good news and hopefully will work. Um, and today we're going to be moving to a couple of types of argument that have a more complex structure. And we're going to be dealing with some issues about how um, to put, so first of all, how to analyze them. We're going to be looking at a specific technique um, for depicting complex forms of argument, which involves argument mapping. And there are going to be a lot of actual exercises of this, so this is actually going to be everything that we'll be doing in the tutorials. Um, and we'll also look at how to evaluate complex forms of arguments. And taken together with what we did last week, this week and last week is going to be relevant for the second assignment task, which is due after Easter break. And also just as a reminder, we have break, mid-semester break next week. The week after that, classes are also canceled because I'll be away. Um, and then we'll start up, I think it's in week six, so the schedule is in the unit guide if you want to make sure. So brief review, what have we done so far? What did we do last week? Well, first of all, we looked at a number of examples of my side bias, so exactly um, how do beliefs, pre-existing beliefs or convictions about whether or not a conclusion is true influence our judgments? as to whether the argument is valid, whether the premises actually support the conclusion. And we saw that my side bias works in both directions, so it kind of blinds us to validity. Um, and that's actually the hard thing um, to look beyond the conclusion to actually evaluate the argument itself, so kind of to activate your validity detectors. That's just the brief reminder. Um, of that, and then from there onwards, we looked at a number of standard forms, so ways in which, or recipes um, for success for arguments, standard ways in which arguments are always valid if they fulfill this recipe, if they <coughs> fulfill exactly or correspond exactly to that format, and also ways in which they can go wrong. Now, there are other ways, so the, the, the types of argument forms I presented you with last time aren't exhaustive, right? So there are obviously many more, but these are going to be the main ones, and these are also going to be the ones that you need for this unit for the assessment task. So if you have these down, you're good to go. So really focus on these and also focus on these when we're constructing arguments in the assignment tasks and then later in the, in the final exam, because um, these ones discussed here, not necessarily on these two slides, but um, this week and last week and in, in the actual lecture slides are going to be everything you need. Um, we saw a basic distinction, and I gave you this kind of shortcut rule for remembering how it goes. And this was that as life-affirming people, we affirm the first thing, right, the first part of an argument that leads to success and we deny later, we deny the second thing. We do not deny the first thing, and we do not affirm the second thing. All of these forms, so this is exactly affirming the first thing. This is perfectly okay. Um, so affirm first, doubt, or deny later. Um, all of these forms come in a um, hypothetical version like this, a conditional version, if A, then B, and they also come in a universal version. And the same is obviously going to be true um, for the invalid forms that kind of mirror them. So in this case, for affirming the second thing, which is a no-no, right? So that is obviously also going to come in a universal form or in a hypothetical form. And when reconstructing, try to do as little violence to the argument as it is in the text as you need to, right? If it says something about all some things, or vegetarians, or people generally, then that is going to be a candidate for universal. If it already has if in it, you're going to go for this one. So that, that's basically the brief compressed wisdom on reconstructing this form. 
Um, the other one, so the inner skeptic in us comes out later, so you can deny the second thing. Um, that will be modus tollens in either the universal or the simple version um, as we have here. But again, it comes with a problem. So if you deny the first thing, denying the antecedent actually leads to an invalid argument. And again, this can be universal or um, in the form in which we have it here, if A then B. So just really my recommendation, really commit these to memory. Um, you don't actually, for the assignment tasks, need to know um, which, um, so there you will just be asked if, um, is it valid or invalid and which form does it have. You won't actually be asked for this label, modus tollens, denying the antecedent, etc. I, I personally recommend learning it nonetheless and also putting it there in the assignment task. Um, you don't strictly need it, but it is kind of a cognitive shortcut and it can be quite useful to learn. So I do recommend this strongly. Okay. Um, so for these ones, modus ponens and modus tollens, we had seen that order matters, right? What you do first and what you do second. That's the message from what I've been saying. Um, here we had two more forms, again, already familiar. Um, and these can be long, long, endless chains of premises, right? Both of these cases, um, especially for this one, the disjunctive syllogism order does not matter, right? It doesn't really matter whether um, if you can shoot out A or B or C or D or what, what order you do it in. Here the point is just you eliminate all options save one, and then the one that you haven't eliminated must be the one that's true. That's the way the or logically functions. And then we have these chains of hypothetical statements that just kind of then can be clumped together into a conclusion, <laughs> right, that unites the first half of the first premise and the last half of the last premise. And again, long, long chains are possible. So this so far is just kind of rehashing what we've done. There's also this um, file on Moodle standard argument forms printed out. That file, that, that document is your friend, right? So look at that one as well. And now in the tutorials, we had kind of a, a few tricky cases that, that caused some headache. So I've just taken them apart and want to review them once more here. And this was these cases, if, unless, only if, and if, and only if. So we now have four versions, and three of those are a little bit tricky, but they're really only tricky if you get them messed up. So that's why I'm taking them apart again here. Um, tutorial three had the exercises and the examples to deal with, and if you had any questions on those, let me know. The solutions are also online. Simple case, this is the boring case that I don't have to say anything about, right? If something, then something else. If A, then B. Um, basically, the first sentence provides us with exactly the reconstruction that we're going to need. That's just the standard case that we don't, don't have to worry about in any way. A bit of a more interesting case, unless, right? I won't tap dance in a penguin costume unless I pass critical thinking. So how do we reconstruct um, this? This means essentially if we translate that, um, if we translate that into kind of a, a sentence that is more, more similar to the structure that we need if A then B because that's what we have to precedent to determine whether if it occurs in an argument this is a valid or invalid argument. Then we get something like if I don't pass the unit, then I won't do this weird tap dance, right? So um, the only way I will do it, in other words, is if I actually pass. If I don't pass, I won't tap dance. It doesn't mean that I will automatically tap dance if I do pass. So how do we reconstruct it? We pull the thing that comes after the unless in green to the front. So that is going to be the A, and we add in a not. Right? So we just take whatever comes after the unless, pull it to the front. That's what goes in here for the A. We add in a not, 
And the first half of the sentence, which is going to be B, if A then B, which is going to be the consequent, we leave that alone. So this already has a knot in there. I won't tap dance. We leave that just as it is. So that's the recipe for reconstructing um, that type of argument with unless. Yeah, and it only goes that one way. Clear? Okay. Um, only if. Next one. Um, and you can go back to this. I color-coded it because I hope that that will make it more clear what's going on here. The only if construction is a bit of a weird one because this is an example where what in the actual sentence comes after the word if is not what is going to come after the if when you reconstruct it as if A then B. Right? So what you essentially have to do, and you have two options here, um, what you essentially have to do is you lose the word only. You pluck out the if out of the middle of the sentence and you move it to the beginning of the sentence. Otherwise, you leave the sentence alone. The first half of the sentence um, is still going to be if A, if I tap dance, the if is translated, transposed to the beginning, and the consequent B is going to be what actually came after the if, right? So in that case, if you go for that reconstruction, you're just moving the if to the beginning of the sentence. Um, if I do the tap dance, then I pass the unit. That what, that's what it means. Alternative two is you pull the whole second half of the sentence, including the if, to the beginning. The whole thing. You lose the only, but that whole thing goes to the beginning. If you're doing that, you have to add in two knots. And that's how it's different from the unless, right? With the unless, you added in one knot. Here you're adding in two. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's what you're doing there. If A, then B would now be if A, A meaning if I don't pass, then B, I won't tap dance. So that is adding quite a lot of reconstruction to that argument. Yeah? So those are the two, two options. Again, it's not guaranteed that if you pass, you will tap dance. It's just if you don't pass, you won't. And if you did dance, then you passed, right? But that, so that's important to be clear on that. Yeah? Final option, if and only if, if with two Fs, um, here, um, anything goes, that, that means two things at the same time. And there down here, this is a bit less complicated. If I tap dance, then I passed. And if I passed, then I will tap dance. Both of those things are true at the same time. So if and only if, two options, only if, one option. Uh, two options, but only one of them. Um, for either reconstruction. You don't need both at the same time. So that's the recipe for dealing with those thorny cases. Yeah? Okay. So just for reference, you can go back to this, look at it, and for now, we'll leave that alone. Okay. Um, so this is what we're doing today, complex arguments. Um, I haven't finished the corrections for your assignment yet. I'll do this this week, so you'll have it in due time before assignment two is due. If you have questions on that, just contact me by email, and we can sort it out. Um, assignment two will be due after Easter break and is about this week and last week. OK. And again, also the reminder, if you need extensions, let me know um, in good time. So what, what are we looking at now? So what we've been doing so far, and this is the first step towards pumping in more complexity into argument evaluation and reconstruction, is we've been thinking about how the premises are linked to the conclusion, right? Do they or don't they support? So that's the relationship that we've been thinking about. We're now adding in an additional level of analysis. And this additional level looks at how the premises relate to each other, right? And there can be different ways, different types of relationship between 
the premises, and this is going to matter for argument evaluation. Um, and the clue is that this doesn't necessarily show up in the standard form reconstruction that we've been using. So what are those two ways? Those two ways are down here. You can have linked premises that depend on each other. They support the conclusion together. Both of them are needed, in other words, to get the conclusion off the ground. Um, most arguments that we've been looking at so far have probably been like this, and you'll see some examples in a minute. Or, well, they can be independent or convergent, right? You can have several different lines of evidence that don't rely on each other, that aren't linked to each other, converging on the same conclusion. Um, and in this case, each premise on its own will sort of provide some measure of support for the conclusion. So we can have linked um, or independent premises. Those are the two main relationships, the two relationships that we'll be looking at here, right? So back to Miss Green, that poor person, we've been recycling her various times. You already know the example. Um, are the premises linked or independent? Snap judgment, do we need both of them to establish the conclusion? Yeah, so I see nodding heads, we need both of them. Yeah, obviously that's an example where they're going to be linked, both are needed. And how do we depict that? So that's where we put in argument maps, right? So here's an argument map. Um, this has been um, shown to be, actually there was, I think, a study a while ago in a critical thinking unit at Monash, and this was one of the most effective measures or ways for actually learning argument analysis. So this is hugely effective and we'll be working with this quite a lot um, this week. So what is an argument map? An argument map has different elements. You see boxes that are labeled. Um, obviously the labels in this case, one and two, are the premises and they have to correspond to what you've put in your standard argument form, obviously, also, so you know how to read it. Um, there's a conclusion, and importantly, it depicts exactly this type of link between the premises. So this is the, the way we depict that they're actually linked to each other. And typically, and this is not really important, just now in the example, the conclusion was at the bottom. Typically, at least to my mind, it's easier to have the conclusion on top than you really have this kind of visual metaphor, right, of the two premises kind of lifting the conclusion or supporting the conclusion. You can do this however you want, conclusion at top or bottom. Um, in theory, you can do it right or left. Um, I suspect that this one on top is going to be the easier one to deal with, yeah? So that's, that's what an argument map is. Now let's and this is interesting because this relationship is exactly something that you wouldn't get in that reconstruction, right? So that adds an additional layer of representation. So have a look at this example. Three premises, a conclusion. Are they linked or independent? And I'll give you just a second to read this and just to kind of catch Catch your breath, think about what it is. So are they linked or are they independent? Linked? What do, do we have any other suggestions out there? Why do we need all of them? Do you want to explain? Yeah. Well, how would you figure that out? Which one would you lose? Right. You can't have any two of the premises, yeah? So one way to figure out whether this is the case if you're not sure 
is doing the really old school method, and again I recommend this, of just covering up one of the premises and seeing if you can still get it off the ground without either of them. Yeah, and in this case it doesn't seem um, that you can do that, right? There's a hypoth First of all, we need some factual claim to move beyond the hypothetical statements to the claim that it actually is getting warmer. So at least this one seems to be needed. If we add just the first one, climate is getting warmer, we would find pools melting. That doesn't connect to sea levels are rising. So in that case, we need number two. If we just had two and three, we would have a connection between melting and rising sea levels, but not to actual getting warmer. This is kind of common sense, but technically speaking, we need them all to get it off the ground, right? And our argument map would be like this in that case. So three premises, they're all on equal footing, and they're all linked to each other, so they're all um, necessary to support the conclusion. Yeah? If the so one thing is, let me see, that would be weird. <laughs> so we have something like, if the climate was getting warmer, um, then sea levels would be rising. And they are indeed rising, and it's getting warmer. Huh. <laughs> huh. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yep. So good, good. Validity detectors are on. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, let's just take two, two and three. Yeah. So if the ice is melting, is A. Sea levels rising. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have, the thing that you would have, if the climate was getting warmer, they would be rising, um, and they are indeed rising, um, so you kind of have, but yeah, it, it's a weird one. You'd need a fourth premise, <laughs> the only way sea levels would rise mm. would be if the ice was melting, mm -hmm. or, or two conditions that can only be yeah. ice is melting. Mm -hmm. Good, good. I have correctors out there. That's good. Um, but they're linked. For now, that's my message. Yeah? <laughs> For now, the message is they're linked. If it's going to work, we need them together. Let's look at this one. Government proposal, government's proposal to introduce, na introduce national identity card should be rejected for several reasons. Identity cards are of doubtful efficiency in tackling identity fraud, etc. Second, the cost of a national identity card system would be staggering and wasteful. And finally, and third, there's widespread opposition to, oppos to the identity cards. So would these be linked or would these be independent? Who says they're linked? Who says they're independent? Yeah. So those seem to be several independent lines of evidence, right? Leading to that conclusion. They don't really support each other, and that's how we would depict that, just kind of independent or distinct lines leading to that conclusion, you yeah? um, know? We'll later see that it's not quite so simple, right? We'll later see that if you have something like that, a single premise, um, or independent premises in this way, in theory there's always kind of an implicit assumption going on there. So actually there's always an unspoken premise that you would have to add in. But for now, um, these seem to be independent lines of evidence and we'll deal with that other problem later.
Yeah, so you can have hybrid cases, right? So you could have hybrid cases, and we'll get to that, where you had a situation where two of these were linked, and this one was just kind of hanging there on its own. Then you would have both of those cases. You would just need to say, look, these two are linked, and that one is independent. So we'll see cases like that later on, but you would really need both both of those things. So this, these are just the toy examples. It gets, it gets a bit more, um, more complicated. Um, so here we have another example, right? So this is really just running you through, through examples. Speed limit should be reduced to 40K per hour. This would reduce the amount of pollution in the cities and make the streets safer for children and pedestrians. Um, what is going on here? Does anybody want to solve that? One, two, three, four. How many premises do we have? And are they, whoops, are they linked or not? No one? Is it a single premise? So that, that kind of is the question, right? We have one sentence, but that doesn't have to be one premise, right? So that's one distinction to draw. That second sentence seems to be saying two different things, right? So it's two premises, linked or independent. Yeah, so two independent ones, yeah, that don't really seem to have much to do um, with each other to get the conclusion off the ground. Okay, um, good. Another example. Um, another speeding one, as a matter of fact. Take a minute, discuss with your nearest neighbor which of these maps is going to be the best one. And really, when you've finished reading, just discuss with your neighbor. Everybody gets to say something. So how many people say A? Just show of hands, how many takers does A have? Does B have any takers? Does C have any takers? Does D have any takers? So some people took nothing, but most most people that took something took the right one, right? So those are, again, three things providing independent support. Is anybody seriously concerned or worried or somehow is this example causing anxiety to anyone <laughs> or should I? Yeah, so you seem to be fairly good with it. Independent support, um, this, this would be the option. Isn't 
Well, you would. That's kind of the thing that I was saying earlier, and in a sense, you're right. So in a sense, you're right that with that kind of a thing, um, with that kind of a thing, you would technically need an extra premise. So there's always kind of an unspoken one that we'd have to add in there. So later in the unit, later in the semester, we'll see that if you have these linked, um, these independent ones like this, that'll always be an indicator that something else has to be going, um, going on there. Yeah. So the way it's set up here, those seem to be different claims, right? But it seems to, and it's going to be a bit of a matter of a judgment call. The way it's set up here, it would seem that to link one and three, we would need some, some other thing positing a connection, as you said, between breaking and attention. So there is something in the background going on there. That's obviously, that's true. Um, but the way they're put out there, they seem to be independent. Yeah, but good, good, you're already all more critical than, than this. Okay, so to sum that up, that's the summary slide. We have these two kinds of relationship between them, and we need to determine what relationship that is to move forward with argument evaluation. So that's kind of the new level. Now there's another level, and this is also one that we've already encountered. Um, and that has to do with sub-arguments. Um, so what is a sub-argument? It's this type of creature, right? And we've had this as well. So here it's already underlined. Um, we have two, and this is an easy one because it gives us signposts. We have two conclusion indicators, right? We can conclude from this that avoiding meat and so on and so forth. And then from that, we include, conclude another thing, therefore, um, people want, who want to reduce the risk of cancer or heart disease should not eat meat. Um, so two conclusions and three, three premises and two conclusions. So first of all, in your standard argument form, <coughs> you would keep those conclusion indicators. And again, there's more implicit stuff going on here. Um, but for now, we would reconstruct it like this. So therefore, and therefore. So that, that's your structure. And for your argument map, you would do it like this, right? There would be a line of things supporting each other. But the important thing for the argument map for now is that these two, one and two, aren't on the same footing, right? They're vertically organized, they're not on the same level, together lending support. But one supports the conclusion only because it, the way it's formulated there, supports two. Um, so that's the main, the main thing to see here. So here's a bit of a harder, or not harder, but another, another example of this. So a computer can't cheat in a game because cheating means deliberately breaking rules in order to win. That's just what cheating means. And a computer can't deliberately do that, namely can't deliberately break rules because it has no freedom of action. And again, we have two conclusion indicators, namely that because, if you remember the signpost slides. Um, so then the trick is to figure out what the main conclusion if, of that argument is going to be, yeah? which, is, which is the final one that it's supposed to lead to, and that's going to be that computers can't cheat in games. So that's the, the grand conclusion to draw, to draw from this argument. And then we could reconstruct that argument, the main argument we call it, like this. So if cu computer can't deliberately break rules, this is what um, um, breaking rules is what is involved in cheating. That's just what cheating means. And together, they're linked. So you need those, both of them, to show that computers can't cheat. 
So that so far is the main argument. That's what we've done so far. Yeah? Yeah? And then what do you do with the other part? So just to show how the reconstruction works. Um, that's that lower part in blue right now. That's the leftover part that we've set aside. That's going to be the sub-argument. Yeah? That's going to be the sub-argument, and we construct it like this. Um, so here we have our main argument. Nothing has changed. But now we have the thing about no freedom of action, and the way the sentence is put, that is supposed to support the claim that computers can't break rules, right? So we add in another therefore, we plop that on top, <laughs> right? So that becomes the first premise, and we do the same thing for the argument. We just hang it on there, yeah? And again, here, here, here is where it becomes important that your numbers correspond to what is in the box, because that can create mix-up, yeah? <laughs> you would evaluate it separately for the standard form. I, it, I hope this will become clearer. I hope this will become clearer. So we now have a hybrid structure. Um, complex structure, and this could get even more complex. So how do you go about this? Will you identify parts of the argument, right? Like I was saying, this is the main argument, and you can evaluate that on its own, and we'll see that as well in a minute. So that's what we call the main argument, and this is what we call the sub-argument, just for terminology. And you can also see that any number of things could be hanging up here, right? It could have a number of linked premises or independent ones, and so on and so forth. Um, we have our grand conclusion at the very bottom. That's the, the, the thing that, it's, that you know, everything else is supporting. And then we have this thing that I was saying a couple of weeks ago. Um, one, which is a hybrid, right? So this is the thing about claims. What is a premise or what is a conclusion depends on the function that the claim is playing in the overall argument. And claims can have different jobs in different arguments. And here we have a hybrid case where it's the same claim can be playing two different roles, can be doing two, two different jobs in one and the same argument. So it's a premise for the main argument. It's a sub-conclusion for the sub-argument. And that needs to be flagged. And this is important. You need to flag that in your standard form reconstruction as well. You need to preface it with therefore and you need to show it in your argument map. Okay, that clear so far? All right, so um, then I'll just talk you through this example. So that is um, a bit of a more difficult, yeah, kind of a, an example of exactly this, this type of thing. Did we just have that example already? I know all of these by now because I was reviewing the lecture, so I don't even know what we had at this point <laughs> in the lecture. So have a look at it. For a person to be guilty, it must be shown that their action caused the death of another person. Hallett beat Smith, uh, Smith unconscious, but he's still not guilty um, because he didn't cause the death. Um, Smith was alive when Hallett left and died later of drowning when the tide came in. So first task then will be to identify the main conclusion, and that's supposed to be that the guy isn't guilty. That's kind of the thing that everything here points to, yeah? That's, um, that's kind of the, the overall outcome of the argument. And then you figure out what argument map, and for reasons of time, I'll just talk you through this one, what argument map is going to represent it. And in this case, it's going to be this one, C. Yeah, those two premises as we have them here together support 
the main conclusion, and then we have this left left over bit. Um, and this is not yet to say that this is a valid argument, but just the way it is represented. Um, where would we add that in that left over bit? Does anybody have a snap um, judgment on that one? Where that would go? Which of those argument maps would represent it? This one, right? That has to be this one, so it's presented in the text as um, saying, well, why, why can't Smith have caused the death? Well, because the guy of Pallet was died later from drowning, so that's why he can't have caused the death. So it seems to be supporting two. And that's also the difference between these two that I just want to draw your attention to. Same structure, but different coding. It doesn't support the general claim about guilt and murder. Yeah? Just that clear? Okay. Good, good. Um, so that's just the quotable the quotable summary from memory, right? What is a sub-argument? A sub-argument sub has um, an argument for a premise. So it's an argument where a premise um, depends on a further argument. Um, and again, this is kind of getting us into more interesting cases, right? Because typically you won't have arguments presenting or premises presenting in isolation. For almost everything interesting that anybody is going to say, you'll actually have sub-arguments like that going on in the background. And if you think back to Aristotle, the prize question then just becomes when to stop, right? Because there's actually this endless chain of these types of structures that can unfold. So what does that mean for argument evaluation? And that'll be the last couple of minutes of the lecture. Um, does that make argument evaluation more complex and more difficult? Kind of, but not necessarily, is the answer. So what we've been saying so far for argument evaluation is that we have three different questions, right? Are the premises true, and do the premises support the conclusion? Those were the two main questions for establishing whether an argument is sound. Support asks about validity. Validity plus truth equals soundness. Um, you can also independently ask whether the conclusion is true. This is a bit risky because of my side bias. Um, however, if you already know that the conclusion is false, and that is the only case, Right? If you definitely know that it is false, then that is a good indicator um, that there's something wrong with the argument. Either the premises, one of the premises are false or they don't support it. So that can be kind of, two can be kind of an extra security question in there. Now we're adding in two additional questions. What is the relationship between the premises and does it contain sub-arguments? Right? In order to really make progress those are the two additional questions that you're going to answer. Um, and now the question becomes, can an argument still, can a conclusion still be supported if we have a case like this? So we have one case of an argument with linked premises. We have one with independent premises. And in both cases, one of the premises is false. What you can see here, the green case again isn't new. If you shoot out one of the premises in an argument with linked premises, then the whole thing is no longer sound. That, no, that's, that's what we've been saying so far. Here the situation is different. Take out one of the premises, you still could have support. So that doesn't automatically damage support. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind, yeah? An, in, an argument with independent premises can still be sound, it can still be successful, even if individual premises fail. And we can make this even stronger. Now let's say we have an argument where one premise is false 
and another premise is true but fails to support the conclusion. We have a single premise. It can still be a successful argument. Yeah? That type of argument can still work. The strength of the argument is going to depend both on the truth of this premise and on how well it supports the conclusion, but in principle this could work. And that tells you something for strategy as well. Right? What are you obviously going to want to do if you want to argue for a conclusion that is very important to you? You find independent lines of evidence supporting it. Um, if you have a very broad basis of many independent argument premises supporting a conclusion, that is going to be very, very hard um, to show that that argument doesn't work. Then your opponent is going to be have to doing a lot of work because your opponent is going to have to shoot down all of those premises individually, right? So that, that is a good strategy if you want to convince someone. You have independent lines of evidence and extra security added in there. Okay, so even in that case, we could still have support. Now let's go back for the last couple of minutes. Is that still good, first of all? Yeah. On the other hand, that also makes your own job harder if you're evaluating somebody who has that kind of an argument, right? Then you have a lot more to do if you want to show that it doesn't work. Okay. So what do we do in this type of a case? How do we evaluate it? How do we break it down? in a case with, you know, different types of premises, sub-arguments, and so far. And I think that comes back to Tessa's question at the beginning, hopefully. Um, so you start out by exactly this, doing the same old thing that we've been doing all along. Is there support in the main argument for the conclusion? Um, are the premises too true? And here we have a sub argument supporting premise two. So what, say we know that premise three is true. We just, we know that for some reason. Whether we say that prem, or that this one is true, sorry, that premise three is true, we need to figure out whether this one works. This is what we outsource to the sub-argument. This is what is going to depend on the additional premise supporting it because this is also a sub-conclusion. So we finish our work for evaluating the main argument as far as we can by answering those two questions. And then we look at the support question um, for the sub-argument. And again, start with support. That's exactly the same thing, just now for a different part of the argument. Um, and there we can say, in that case, there's no, no real support there, you know. Um, somebody could still, um, you can cause the death of somebody even if they're still alive when you leave. So that doesn't really hold. So support in this case is not given. The argument fails. Is the premise true? Is premise one true? Let's say it is doesn't really matter, though, because even if it was, it wouldn't support the sub-conclusion, right? So now what happens, now what happens to the overall argument in this case? Yeah. Yeah. So it's linked, right? Because two and three are linked. We have a failure of support from one to two, but two and three are both needed to get the conclusion, so the whole thing is going to collapse. And that's where this visual depiction is actually quite nice, right? Because you shoot out two and it's just going to kind of tip over. It no longer has a basis. Um, yeah, okay, good, yeah. <laughs> well, that. Well, we're not, let's put it this way, I'm not concerned about that level of the technicality for today. Um, so all I wanted to say with this example um, was the structure of it.
that acceptable? <laughs> um, argument mapping do's and don'ts. Just a few last words of advice before you actually have to do this in the toots and in the assignments. And I do recommend going back to this. Sounds stupid um, on the slide. These are mistakes that people do make. Don't construct, please don't construct an argument map that doesn't match your argument. So in the assignment task, you'll have to do standard form plus an argument map. Now one possibility is that you get the reconstruction wrong. Right? So there is a possibility that you just didn't construct it correctly, but you still gave me an argument map that matches the, the false argument that you reconstructed. I can still give you points for that. Read, I will still give you points if your map matches your standard reconstruction. But if we have two different arguments going on there, for instance, something like this, plus you got the wrong standard form, then I can't give you points, right? So please don't do that. Make sure that those things map, match up, yeah? So one thing that's extremely important here is that, and that goes in both directions, you need, if you have this type of a structure, then you need to have two therefores up there as well. Otherwise, you won't have indicated that there are subconclusions. So be really nitpicky and pedantic about this. If this is happening, flag that there is your additional subconclusion flagged in the standard form um, reconstruction as well. And also make sure that your numbers match up. So really look at it in both ways. Do you have additional layers here that aren't flagged there? Okay, those are covered. And then look, okay, so here I'm saying one is the premise. So check whether that is still one in your standard form. So those really match up so you don't lose points for something unnecessary like that. Okay, so that's, that's the summary. And with that, um, we're done. So those are the summarized questions that you asked. One last thing. This is complex, but the way I've presented it here, evaluating complex arguments isn't complex. It just involves breaking them down into little simple units that are exactly the same as everything you've been doing. Have a good lunch break and or see you in toots.